Greetings from Latter-day Media, presenting our dear friend and epic historian on Joseph Smith and Church History, Brother K. Godfrey. Episode 6, Doctrine and Covenants 10-12, through 12, The Misunderstood Years, 1825-1828, to 1828, Part 1. Welcome back. It's good to be with you. Last time we met, I talked about three very, very interesting podcasts that I wanted to do that focused in on a period of time between 1825 and 1830. We're going to begin those podcasts, those three special podcasts today. But before we do so, I have a few things I'd like to show you. Um, Over my shoulder, you see a picture of the Prophet Joseph Smith. This particular sketch was done by Henry K. Jakubowski. Mr. Jakubowski is from uh, Padua, Corchiba, Brazil. And this particular sketch was done in 1969. I acquired it just in the last couple of months. I have a lot of very, very unique artwork. I'm going to start to share some of that with each of our podcasts. But as an archaeologist, you'd think I'd have artifacts too, and I do have artifacts. I brought two I'd like to share with you. The first one is the brick I have right here. This is an original 1810 chimney brick from the Isaac and Elizabeth Hale home in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And then the other foundation stone that I brought is a foundation stone from Joseph and Emma's home also in Harmony, Pennsylvania. So a couple of stones. I've got uh, a lot of stones actually and I'm going to bring some of them and, and share them with you as we go through our podcast. So to begin our podcast today, we're going to cover three years, or portions of three years, 1825 through 1828. And the slide that you see is the uh, travels of Joseph during these particular years, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about each of these places and what events took place there. But to begin with, this is a very old map showing a combination of Vermont and New Hampshire, And I'm showing this to give you some perspective for just a moment. Uh, You see where Sharon, Vermont is, and we've talked extensively about Sharon, Vermont. But Wells, Vermont, Wells, Vermont, 1790 uh, map shows the location of Wells and the location where Isaac Hale uh, lived. Isaac will meet and marry Elizabeth Lewis while living in Wells, Vermont in 1790. Um, It's also the home or the birthplace of Oliver Cowdery, Wells is. In 1791, Isaac and Elizabeth Hale are going to settle in Harmony, Pennsylvania, where Isaac bought a 150-acre farm with a small log home. At the time he purchased the, uh, the, the property, it was called Willingsboro. Willingboro, and then changed to Harmony. And today, if you wanted to look and find where this location is, you're going to look for Oakland, Oakland, Pennsylvania. Now, the Hales were some of the original settlers in what we're going to call the Harmony, Pennsylvania area. Eight of the nine Hale children were born in Harmony. Now, while living in Vermont, Isaac Hale was an, was a, a great hunter. He hunted bear and elk and deer, and he was very skilled at this. And he brought these skills with him uh, when he moved to Harmony, and he was very successful in finding game and in sharing. He was quite charitable in sharing with his neighbors and friends. Around 1810, Isaac and his family moved the log home they were living in off of its foundation, and they built a two-story home in its place. Lucy Mack Smith saw the Hale home in 1828 when visiting Joseph once, and she said, and I quote, the Hale home is a mansion with every convenient appendage necessary. In 1825, Joseph Smith will lodge in the Hale's old log home that they moved off the foundation while he worked in the area for Josiah Stoll. Now we're going to learn a lot about Josiah Stoll here in just a few minutes. In 1827, after his marriage to Emma, Emma and Joseph would briefly stay in the Hale Mansion. The home has now been, as you can see, reconstructed on its original location. All right, well, now we've got the Hales settled in and Emma settled in. Let's go find Joseph. He's in Palmyra, and he's 20 years old. 
In October of 1825, there was a lot of persecution with the Prophet Joseph in the Palmyra area, and the family was in need of some funds, and so Joseph and his father took employment with an acquaintance named Mr. Josiah Stoll, the same fellow I alluded to just a moment ago. Now, Mr. Stoll is from Colesville, New York. Now, Colesville, New York still is there today, but Mr. Stoll's home actually resided in what was called then South Bainbridge. And if you're looking for that again today, you're going to find it as Afton, New York. Afton, New York. The two towns we'll refer to today are Afton or South Bainbridge and Colesville, those two days. And so they took employment with Mr. Stoll. And you can see that uh, uh, it's quite a journey from Palmyra down to the South Bainbridge area, some seven, eight day journey of 160 plus miles. Josiah Stoll was a farmer in the South Bainbridge area, and uh, he had uh, come to Palmyra because of relatives that he was coming to visit and to sell some of his crops that he had uh, that he had grown in, in the Palmyra area. And uh, while he was there, he heard of Joseph Smith's heavenly encounters. And so he was quite interested in this. And he had heard that both Joseph and his father, Joseph Smith Sr., uh, had possession of special keys that allowed them to discern things that were invisible to the eye. And Joseph and his father did have a reputation of being able to find lost things. Now, this particular slide here of Joseph Searstone kind of brings this to the forefront. Uh, Joseph did have a Searstone at this particular time. Lucy Smith said, quote, These were the keys that enabled Joseph to see things invisible to the natural eye. In fact, Brigham Young once said, quote, Every man who lives on earth was entitled to a Searstone and should have one, but they are kept from them in consequence of their wickedness. Later in life, Joseph would learn that the gift of seeing through a stone was a gift from God and a work of a seer, whereas the craft of peeping was deceptive and fraudulent. Let me read you this slide for just a moment. This slide is taken from a display at the Aaronic Priesthood Restoration Site in Harmony, Pennsylvania. It says, of divine process, Joseph Smith was inspired by God in his effort to translate the ancient record. At times, when exercising the gift of revelation, Joseph used sacred physical objects to translate. He used the translation instruments buried with the record, the Urim and Thummim, and at other times he used a seer stone, which he placed inside of a hat to block out light. At first, Joseph copied characters from the plates before trying to translate them. Over time, he often worked without referring to the plates which were covered or hidden close by. And as you can see, many, many prophets of the past have used stones at one time or another. Aaron, the brother of Jared, John the Revelator, Mosiah, Abraham, and Joshua, and, and others have discerned things using stones. Where well, Mr. Stoll met with and then hired Joseph and his father, as well as some neighbors, to come to the South Bainbridge area and search for lost Spanish treasure. In particular, he's looking for a silver mine somewhere near the Susquehanna River. Stoll believed that he had located an ancient Spanish mine where coins were minted and buried. The site was about 26 miles south or downstream from his home near the town of Harmony, Pennsylvania. An article of agreement indicates that Joseph and his father were to receive two elevenths of what was uncovered in the mine. So there were 11 people working for Mr. Stoll. Until the treasure was found, Joseph and his father would be paid $14 per month. Although money digging or treasure hunting was of epidemic proportions in upstate New York at the time, and even though Joseph's employment lasted just one month, he was tagged with that derogatory title of digger. And because of his associations with those looking for buried treasure, there would be many false and vicious lies that would be spread and perpetuated about the prophet. Let me read this slide to you. It's rather interesting. 
it's taken from the Palmyra Reflector, the local newspaper, reports that, quote, men and women without distinction of age or sex became marvelously wise in the occult sciences. Many dreamed dreams and others saw visions of shining riches deep within the earth. And then Martin Harris had an occasion to look for treasure. Martin Harris himself dug for treasure on at least one occasion. After Joseph secured the plates, Martin and two others ventured to the Hill Cumorah, looking for, quote, more boxes of gold. Harris remembered the excitement when they, in fact, located a stone box, which they carefully dug around and prepared to unearth. According to Martin, at the moment they went to lift it, quote, some unseen power slid the box into the hill as we stood there looking at it. Well, Martin Harris remembered Joseph saying, quote, The angel told me I must quit the company of the money diggers. There are wicked men among them, and I must have no more to do with them. Only two places are known to have been dig sites of the Josiah Stowe group. One is located about one mile north of the Susquehanna River in Harmony, Pennsylvania area. The other is in the foothills north of the Josiah Stowe home in Acton, New York. Now, I've been to both these locations a number of times. I feel, however, neither would be discernible today. Josiah Stowe was 56 years old and became a very close friend to the prophet Joseph. He was well-to-do and active in the Presbyterian church. After a month of fruitless searching, Joseph prevailed upon Josiah to end the search. Joseph then spent most of 1826 in southern New York, working on the Stowe farm. Joseph went to school in South Bainbridge and possibly labored in Joseph Knight's carding mill. What is a carding mill? It's used to straighten fabrics or fibers for weaving cloth. The Knights lived just three and a half miles downstream in Colesville. The Knights also became some of Joseph's best friends. Joseph made many trips to his friends in South Bainbridge and Colesville. However, he was not without his persecutors. In March of 1826, he was arrested for disorderly conduct. He was arrested again in 1829 on the same charges. And these are the first two of 46 times Joseph is going to be arrested on some trumped-up charges. The locals felt that Joseph was attempting to swindle money from Josiah Stowell. But it was hard to convict Joseph when Josiah was such a strong supporter of Joseph and his teachings. When Joseph was put on trial for disorderly conduct, it was the testimony of Josiah Stowell and his two daughters that helped Joseph earn his acquittal. You can see this particular slide here calls Joseph a glass looker or a peeper. The charges have been brought by a nephew of Josiah. His name was Peter Brigman. Reading from the court record of the trial of Joseph Smith Jr., it states, Question. Deacon Stowell, do I understand you as swearing before God under solemn oath that you have taken, that you believe that Joseph Smith is called of God? Answer, do I believe it? Do I believe it? No, it is not a matter of belief. I positively know it to be true. Now, John Reed, a noted attorney and lawyer who helped defend Joseph in the local court, said, Joseph was truthful and intelligent. Josiah Stowell Jr. said, Joseph was a fine, likable young man, and at the time did not profess religion. He was not a profane man, although I did once in a while hear him swear. He never gambled, to my knowledge, I do not believe he ever did, and I never knew him to get drunk. Josiah Stowell did more than employ Joseph to look for lost treasure. He would later be the means of provided needed supplies to Joseph and Emma in harmony, which would allow Joseph to continue to translate the Book of Mormon. The night Joseph received the golden plates from the angel Moroni, Josiah Stowell and his friend Joseph Knight were at Joseph's parents' home, ready to assist the prophet in any way possible. Joseph forged lifelong friendships with both the Stoles and their neighbors, the Joseph Knight family. Josiah Stowell believed in Joseph to the very last. In 1843, Josiah wrote of Joseph, and I quote, He never knew anything of him but that was right. 
and also knew him to be a seer and a prophet and believed in the Book of Mormon to be true. Well, while employed in the digging effort, Joseph stayed at a cabin owned by Mr. Isaac Hale of Harmony, Pennsylvania. And as it was this time that Joseph would meet Emma, Emma Hale. Emma was a, <clears throat> a 23-year-old school teacher born July 10, 1804. She fell in love with Joseph. The Hales were staunch Methodists and disapproved, however, of the relationship between Joseph and Emma. In early January of 1827, Emma made a trip to Colesville to visit her cousins named Wesson. While there, she was convinced that marriage to Joseph was the right thing to do. Finally, on January 18, 1827, Joseph and Emma eloped to South Bainbridge to the home of Josiah Stowell and were married at the home of Justice of the Peace, Zachariah Tarbell. Then, because of hard feelings with the Hales family, Joseph and Emma moved to Palmyra to live with Joseph's parents. Joseph and Emma moved into the Smith's framed home. Joseph's older brother, Alvin, started construction of the framed home in 1822. Unfortunately, Alvin died in 1823 from a misdiagnosed illness and was unable to finish the home. The home was actually completed in 1825 and much appreciated by Joseph and Emma as they arrived in January of 1827. Eight months later, on the evening of September 22, 1827, Joseph and Emma drove a carriage owned by Joseph Knight to the hill called Camorra. The time had arrived for obtaining the plates. And I quote, On the 22nd day of September, 1827, having gone as usual to the end of another year to the place where they were deposited, the same heavenly messenger, Moroni, delivered them up to me with this charge, that I should be responsible for them, that if I should let them go carelessly or through any neglect of mine, I should be cut off but that if I would use all my endeavors to preserve them until he, the messenger, should call for them, they should be protected. Lucy Smith observed on that night, quote, Joseph's wife passed through the room with her bonnet and riding dress, and in a few minutes they left together, taking Mr. Knight's wagon. I spent the night in prayer and supplication to God. Well, Joseph was given the sacred record by the hands of the angel Moroni. He then hid them in the hollow of a fallen tree. Ten days later, he returned on foot to the hiding place to retrieve the plates. On his return home, his mother Lucy recounts the story how Joseph was attacked by two, maybe three assailants. He succeeded in fighting them off and quickly traveled the two and a half miles back to his home, carrying the 50 plus pounds of plates. Clearly, there was divine intervention assisting Joseph. Well, the prophet often kept the plates hidden inside and around the farm. In January of 1828, persecution continued to follow Joseph in Palmyra, especially now that he had obtained the golden plates. Now, some of those who tried to get the plates from Joseph were his neighbors, people like Willard and Sally Chase, or Will Murdoch, or John Stafford and his sons. They had formed their own money-digging operation, and it was going on at this time, and they would hound and follow Joseph continually, always looking for a chance to take the plates from his possession. Well, to escape these problems, Joseph and Emma went back to live in Harmony, Pennsylvania. It seems that Father Hale had tempered his feelings somewhat about Joseph and wanted his daughter to return home. He promised Joseph that if he would forsake his money digging, that he could live in a home built by Jesse, one of Emma's brothers who had moved west. The cabin site was about 150 yards from where Emma's parents, Isaac and Elizabeth, lived. They would eventually buy the home and its surrounding 13 acres for $200. Alva Hale, one of Emma's brothers, helped move Joseph and Emma to Harmony. Alva was a believer in Joseph and actually assisted in guarding the plates from time to time. 
While living in Harmony, Pennsylvania, Joseph would receive 16 revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let's briefly review those for a moment. Section 3 is Joseph lost the power to translate. Section 5 is three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Section 8, Oliver Cowdery promised to be Joseph's scribe. Section 12, a great and marvelous work was to happen. Section 13, John the Baptist confers the Aaronic priesthood on Joseph and Oliver. Section 25, Emma Smith to compile a psalm book. And t section 27, water was to be used instead of wine for the sacrament. In October of 1827, Emma would be expecting. With Joseph trying to farm and to translate and to care for his uh, expecting wife, it became very, very evident that Joseph was going to need help. By early winter of 1828, that help is going to arrive in the form of a scribe. Let me share with you one of the most interesting stories about this scribe. Quote, it was in the summer of 1847. Now, get that, 1847. A knock came to the Pilkington door. A stranger appeared. He needed to hire a boy to do chores. He would provide room and board and a two-year-old heifer for a year's labor. Fourteen-year-old Willie Pilkington then left with the stranger, the first they had seen since moving into the Utah Territory. That evening, Willie was given a pan of milk and bread and two quilts and told to sleep on the floor. While laying on the floor that evening, he suddenly saw in the dark corner an emancipated old man. The man beckoned Willie to come near. He spoke of his past, of an ancient civilization, and of gold plates. Shuffling to his feet, the 92-year-old placed his walking cane in his left hand, drew himself upright, and dramatically struck his right hand against his breast. I am Martin Harris, and I was there. Thomas Harris, great-great-great-grandfather to Martin Harris, established the Harris family for four generations in Rhode Island. In 1780, Nathan Harris, that would be Martin's father, left and went to upstate New York. In 1794, Nathan purchased 600 acres for $300 near Palmyra, New York. The town was called Swift's Landing at the time, after its first owner, owner General John Swift. Now, its name's been changed somewhat. It went from Toland to finally Palmyra, but let me read to you this slide. It says the town named Palmyra in 1796 was after two Syrian cities located near the Dead Sea. These cities, called Palmyra, were oasis cities for assisting traveling caravans. Now, the word Palmyra translates from the Aramaic Greek Hebrew word tadmok which translates to palm leaves. Palm leaves were waved and placed, of course, in the front of Jesus Christ as he entered through the golden gates into Jerusalem for the Passover. And, of course, you can find that in scriptures today. Martin was born May 18, 1783, the second of eight children. In 1792, Martin was 10 years old, and he went to the first school in the area called Swift School again named after uh, General Swift, General John Swift. Now Martin is going to become a very healthy, fleshy, robust man, about five feet eight inches tall. He had blue eyes and a light complexion. He had hair that swept to the side and curled around his ears, and he had a very distinctive, stylish beard that he wore on his lower chin and jaw. Now in 1818, he married his almost 16-year-old first cousin. Her name is Lucy Harris. In her midlife, Lucy became quite hard of hearing and very, very distrustful. In 1813, Martin paid $1,050 for 145 acres of land that was located just north of his father's farm. Martin would eventually own 320 acres of farmland in Palmyra. Both in property and money, his estate was estimated to be worth $1.7 million. Now, a little bit about Martin in this slide. This is not Martin's home. This is a, um, a home that sits on, on where Martin's uh, 
home used to be, and it's a home that now is owned by the church and missionaries that serve in the Palmyra area. Actually, a couple of senior couples live there in that particular home. But Martin sought for reform in the farming industry and was a town leader. He also sought for religious tolerance and took a role in the local anti-Masonic crusade. Uh, Harris had two problems with local religion. Uh, first, the definition of the Trinity was convoluted and very hard for him to grasp. Uh, the second, the question of who has the authority to act in God's name um, bothered him. Bothered him. He, he couldn't put his arms around that. Now, Joseph Smith toiled with Martin Harris in his cornfield, uh, picking corn many times for about 15 cents a day. And it was there that Martin Harris learned about the golden plates. And on a number of occasions, Joseph had exhibited great spiritual insights that Martin took a keen interest in. Lucy Harris was adamant about seeing the plates. Um, she offered $200 in aid to uh, be a part of this translation process. However, Joseph, Joseph wasn't going to buy into that. In fact, her comments to her were, and I quote, I always prefer dealing with men rather than their wives. Now, on a side note, a few months later, Lucy is going to accuse Joseph of trying to defraud her husband. She's going to have Joseph hauled into court, and the judge is going to say, and I quote, keep such ridiculous matters out of my courtroom. He then allowed Joseph to go free. In 1831, Martin is going to separate from Lucy. Martin's going to end up moving to Kirtland, and Lucy is going to stay in Palmyra. Now, when Martin learned that Joseph had secured the plates, he went directly to the Smith home and started to interview everybody. He interviewed Emma and Joseph's brothers and sisters about what had taken place. Joseph at this time wasn't at home. He was at the Peter Ingersoll farm uh, working at that particular time. Martin sought Joseph out, and Joseph told Martin that the angel had told him to look into the special stones to determine who should be chosen to assist in the translation process, and it was none other than Martin. And Martin told Joseph, and I quote, You must not blame me for not taking your word, but if the Lord will show me that it is his work, you can have all the money you want. Martin then went and knelt in prayer. He made a covenant to help if it was the Lord's will. Martin later explained, and I quote, He then showed me that it was his work, and that it was designed to bring the fullness of his gospel to the Gentiles to fulfill his word. Martin knew that he was now bound by covenant. It was then that Martin became involved in the translation process and printing, eventually, of the Book of Mormon. Later, he would mortgage 240 acres of his farm to raise the printing costs of $3,000 to the firm of E.G. Grannon so they could print the first 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. On a, on a side note, you might find this... Uh, this is interesting, that the first edition of the Book of Mormon uh, sold for about $1.25, which was equivalent to three days' labor. Today, an original copy of the Book of Mormon would sell between sixty dollars and $100,000, depending on its condition. That's if you could find one. Today, there's probably less than 500 original copies that are even known to be in existence. In 1869, Elder Stevenson, while on a mission to the eastern states, stopped in Kirtland to visit Martin Harris. He suggested Martin come to Utah. Martin eventually wrote Brigham Young, who encouraged him to do so, and in 1870, he made the journey. Martin will pass away on July 10, 1875, in Clarkston, Cache County, Utah. On a side note, because of Martin's conversion, his older brother, Emer Harris, joined the church. Now, Emer was called on a mission in 1832 to, the north, to northeastern Pennsylvania, and for a good portion of the time he served, Martin's going to be his companion. They were quite successful in their missionary efforts, baptizing perhaps a hundred people. Now, some of those baptized included a family by the name of Oaks, relatives of Elder Dallin. Harris Oaks. 
Now, these first three years of Joseph's misunderstood years uh, saw trouble and trial and misunderstanding and death. But he also experienced love, marriage, obedience, and accomplishment. The angel said, quote, Your name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. Joseph would later say, It seems as though the adversary was aware at a very early period of my life that I was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer to his kingdom. Else why should the powers of darkness combine against me? Why the opposition and persecution that arose against me almost in my infancy? So these are the first three years. We've spent uh, time today going in depth to these first uh, three years of 1825 through 1828, talking extensively about Joseph's digger period of time, Josiah Stowell and Joseph Knight, two new friends of the prophet Joseph, and we've introduced to you now Martin Harris. Our next podcast will cover the years of 1828 and 1829, and we'll introduce to you in depth again new friends of Joseph's, and we'll proceed to uh, try to uncover what was taking place down in Harmony that uh, perhaps has been misunderstood. And uh, we're going to reveal those things to you, and we hope that you'll enjoy that particular podcast. So until then, thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening today and for sharing this ComeFollowMe2021.com website. This Come Follow Me video series is a bonus resource to enhance your appreciation of the Prophet Joseph Smith with little-known facts and research about American and church history. We sure appreciate those who have been contributing on our Patreon page under Latter-day Media. We'll have a link in the show notes, and we would love to invite more to help support this work. To contact Kay, email him at footstepsofjoseph at gmail.com. And coming soon are six hours of DVDs following the footsteps of Joseph.